Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here for our monthly civic forum with the League of Women Voters. My name is Jen Lemberger, and I am a librarian here at the Central Library, so thank you again for joining us. Um, these are monthly, minus the summer, so every third Wednesday of the month. Um, it's noon or in the evening, so pay attention to when those are, but we're really pleased to see this many people here um, at our noon time. So thank you for taking time out of your day to hear about a timely and always important issue to make sure that we are taking care of everyone in our community. We know what's going on and we know how we can contribute and help out uh, as well as advocate. Um, we have, I'm just making sure everyone's sort of situated. Um, we have a couple of events coming up on behalf of the library um, that everyone might be interested in. One of them is this evening, so if you just want to spend your whole day at the library and come on back this evening at 6 o'clock, um, we are having a event in commemoration of the 50th anniversary of the 1969 oil spill. So this is still the largest oil spill that it's occurred off the coast of California. It is the third largest that the U.S. has ever had. And this evening we'll be having a art talk and panel titled Art and Environmental Activism. So we will be having a Squire Foundation uh, artist, Brenda Longfellow, presenting her interactive documentary called Offshore. So we are all quite familiar with offshore drilling platforms. Um, and so this is a really fantastic, interactive, digital environment that she's created to look at offshore oil platforms um, and their effect and sort of the long-term um, effects that they have. Um, so she'll be presenting that, and then we have three other artists joining her who all have um, worked with the environment, work with nature, and talking about how um, art has been integral to the environmental movement um, and moving advocacy and action forward. So that's tonight at 6 o'clock. Um, and then we also have our Social Justice Book Club, which everyone can join, which is monthly. That was last night. Next month, we are reading Dear America by Jose Antonio Vargas. He will actually be at UCSB via their Multicultural Center speaking for free at uh, Campbell Hall on February 12th. Um, and then we have our meeting on February 19th, so you can get that flyer in the back, as well as um, already advocating everyone to come to our Women Who Defied the Odds event, which is a um, dramatic monologues uh, with drama dogs. Uh, they're one of our local theater troops, and so it'll be six women who in history have defied the odds, and we'll be doing that as a performance. So that will be in March for Women's History Month, and all of those flyers are in the back for you all to pick up. Um, today, we are talking about work that is being done in our community for our homeless community members, um, and we have a ton of experts here, uh, many, many years of experience, as well as talking about our upcoming point in time count. So, hope you all get involved and learn something today, and with that, I will introduce Joni Jones, co-president of the League of Women Voters of Santa Barbara. Welcome, everybody. I'm so happy to see you all here. Please check your cell phones and make sure they are off. We don't want any interruptions. Uh, we'd like to thank the Santa Barbara Public Library for co-sponsoring our forum uh, with the League of Women Voters and also thank Gary Atkins for giving sound, Sylvia Urbe uh, for, from Transil, uh, uh, linguistic services and um, for giving simultaneous Span uh, Spanish translation and if you would like to sit beside her or come up beside her you would be able to hear that and that will be also on um, it we are live streaming today on Facebook um, but it will be on um, videotape uh, later in the uh, in the week um, the forum is being uh, uh, recorded right now by TV Santa Barbara and will be available on Channel 17. And you may also check our league website 
um, for the forum under our YouTube channel. Just click on it and you'll see all of our forums. And on their website, tvsb.tv, you may go on On Demand and under Video. You can then check their schedule and see when it's going to be in English or Spanish. Uh, and it also, uh, our website is lwvsantabarbara.org. If you're interested in learning more about the League of Women Voters, Bev is in the back at the red covered table and she'll be, um, you're welcome to check with her for membership and any other information you would like. Um, thank you for organizing this Emily Allen and um, getting all of our speakers. Our next forum is on February 20th and it will be about, um, are we able to help our foster youth? And our questions and answers are going to follow the final speaker. We will take a break to collect the um, cards, which are back on the back table over there um, with the black covering. And a reminder that the League of Women Voters does not support or endorse parties or any candidates. So please refrain from uh, partisan questions or comments or announcements. We have just a few reminders of things that are happening. Um, AAUW is a coalition partner. They're having the hunting ground at the Goleta Library on January 17th. Uh, and that is tomorrow, let's see, tonight? Uh, tomorrow night on Thursday. And um, we have uh, another partner, uh, Planned Parenthood is uh, sponsoring Rock and Roll, a fundraiser and uh, VIPs come at six to seven. You can find out all about it on their website. Uh, it is from seven to 10 on January 24th. On January 27th, the, uh, I think you've heard about it, the Environmental Coalition Oil Spill 50th anniversary event. And we'll be at the, uh, it will start at three o'clock with tabling at two and it'll be at the Arlington. We have lots of things going on in the league and you can find them on our website, www.lwvsantabarbara.org. Um, there's a women's march that we're um, having a speaker at as well as many others. The speaker's gonna be two minutes. Uh, Martin Luther King weekend is this weekend. Lots of things happening for that uh, and there will be a special um, event at uh, De La Guerra Plaza starting at 9 and at uh, the Arlington. And that is Monday the 21st, but there are many things before that. And um, just check out our website. You'll find all the other things we're doing. And I'd like to turn over the announcements. Oh, and there will be um, this card. There's a new Women's Empowerment Fund that's uh, doing a film and it will be back at the back table. So, Emily. Okay, thank you. Um, welcome everybody, it's great to see all of you here. My name's Emily Allen, I'm the program director with the United Way of Northern Santa Barbara County and the Home for Good program. Our homeless and veteran programs are countywide, so we work here in Santa Barbara also. And I'm gonna introduce, have Jeff come up and introduce himself, and then I'll um, introduce the panel. Yeah, I'm Jeff Schaefer. I'm also with Home for Good. I'm the Director of Community Engagement, so thanks for having us here uh, today. So today we'll be leading you through a new presentation we have called Homelessness 101, but we're gonna be doing that with the help and support of our panel. And I'm gonna have them introduce themselves and tell you a little bit about themselves and their organizations now. So we'll start with Kimberly Albers, the new program, um, Homeless Programs Director at the County of Santa Barbara. 
Um, so thank you. So I'm really honored to be here on the panel with um, the direct service providers really doing the work. Um, but here at the County of Santa Barbara, in the County of Santa Barbara, I'm part of the Housing and Community Development Division, and I serve as the Homeless Assistance Program Manager. And so what does that mean? What do we do? So a lot of things we do is we administer several federal, state, and local funding sources um, that address homelessness in the community. And so a lot of those funds are passed through um, to providers and then some for us to actually um, help administer some of, the, of that programming. And so many of you have heard recently there's quite a bit of new funding coming from the state. So traditionally we've seen a lot of federal funding, or not a lot, but the majority of the funds we administer were federal funds, but we really see the state of California stepping up in a big way um, with additional funding. In fact, in the last um, couple of months, we've been awarded over $10 million in one-time funding to address homelessness, which is um, largely being passed on um, to the providers. Another thing we do is we coordinate the continuum of care as the lead agency, which is a community-wide planning group uh, that does amazing work in, in making sure that there's a true system of care, a crisis response to homelessness in this community. We are in the process right now of crafting a strategic homeless plan, um, on be a regional homeless plan. Um, we are finishing up kind of phase one, um, but just getting ready to launch phase two in the spring of this year, and this is a great way for the community to get involved and be part of that effort to have community voices as well as providers and um, elected officials, et cetera, participate in that strategic homeless plan. So that's something going on through our office. And last, I think it's really important for everyone to know that we coordinate the Homeless Management Information System, or HMIS, database where we actually are able to track the outcomes of participants and programs that enter their data um, into the system. And so what it does is it gives us um, important information about how many people are being served um, on a given day and a, and a given year. It tells us how many times people are returning to homelessness after a permanent housing placement. It tracks permanent housing placements and are people staying in their homes how long someone is homeless prior to placement. And all of that data really helps us um, tailor programs to become more effective. And so just to give you an example, um, I know by looking at last year's grant year that in, if someone was enrolled in one of the uh, pro homeless programs for over 90 days, 65% of them had a positive housing outcome. Where if they were enrolled for less than 90 days, only 18% had a positive housing outcome. And so those are the kind of things we can take back to providers and say, why? Because we want to house people as quickly as possible, but if the outcome is that different, why is the outcome so different? So that's the kind of work we're doing at the county. It's very exciting, and as Emily mentioned, I'm new, and so I come by way of um, San Bernardino, Riverside, Kern County, and most recently at Seminole County, Florida. So have seen a lot of um, continuum of cares and system of cares around homelessness, how they work, and so just very excited to be here in the County of Santa Barbara um, with you today. Great, thank you. And next we have Chuck Flax. He is the Director of Programs at PATH Santa Barbara. Hi, thank you so much for coming. What a great, amazing turnout of people from all different aspects of this. And many of you probably could be up here uh, giving the presentation, because um, I see a lot of people, experts, and. Um, people who work with homeless people in, in the community here today. And I think that's important. I think something that has happened in the last two years is that we've seen a systematic embracing of this issue by virtually every level from, from street outreach to government agencies to housing providers to our county agencies like Behavioral Wellness, and they're here, to youth service providers linking arms to the to cottage hospital, they're here as well, um, linking arms around the problem of homelessness and addressing it in a systematic and systemically uh, evidence-based way. And for many years in Santa Barbara, we couldn't have said that. I think we were, there were a lot of very concerned people, there were a lot of people putting significant amounts of personal resources and time and energy into ending the problem. But to some extent, we were working at cross purposes or we weren't aligned. And what's happened in the last two years is that's happening, and it's happening fast, and it's happening very successfully. And it's, you know, you're actually here, part of that process. We Home for Good is responsible for putting together the coordinated entry system, and they're gonna talk more about that. Kimberly is coordinating services and programs 
of all different kinds and funding sources around the whole county. We're now seeing linkages that didn't used to exist. And it's frankly very exciting, and it couldn't come at a better time because we're also seeing an increase in the number of people who are homeless, and we'll learn about that as well. PATH is a statewide organization. Um, we run from San Diego up to San Jose. We, we serve in 120 cities. We have 600 staff. We're a $62 million a year operation. It makes us one of the largest homeless serving agencies in the country. PATH. P-A-T-H, or People Assisting the Homeless. Um, here in Santa Barbara, we came three years ago and took over what was formerly Casa Esperanza, which some of you may know a lot about. Many of you volunteer with us, I've seen you. Um, and the, the change is we are still an emergency shelter, but we have 100 program beds that are focused on this coordinated entry system process of getting people rapidly into housing permanent housing, because we're, our goal statewide is to end homelessness in all its forms. And here locally, our primary focus is on chronically homeless people, adults, um, not in families, not, not, uh, not with children, but just specifically chronically homeless adults. Um, so we have 100 program beds, and then we can expand up to 200 beds during emergency weather or fires or other kinds of uh, disaster situations. Um, so like right now, we've actually been open with capacity of up to 200 since, pretty much since Christmas because of the rains and the cold. Um, we're looking at a break in it on Friday and, and uh, we can finally kind of clean everything up and get back to program work. But um, so that's what we're about. And if you have questions about our programs, I'm, I'm more than happy to answer them. Great. Not Yet questions, but soon questions. So next we have Rob Fredericks. He's the executive director, CEO of the Housing Authority of the City of Santa Barbara. Good afternoon, everyone. So the Housing Authority of the City of Santa Barbara, we are the operating arm, uh, affordable housing operating arm of the city. And we've had a rich history of providing affordable housing uh, for many different groups in our community that, that need the help. Uh, for over 50 years. This is our 50th anniversary this year in uh, providing affordable housing. We've provided over 1,300 units of affordable housing that we've built and managed on our own within the city. And we also operate the, um, the, the Section 8 uh, Rental Assistance Housing Choice Voucher Program here in the city on the entire South Coast. And um, that is a federal uh, rental assistance program. And through all of these programs, the hard units and the rental assistance uh, that we provide, we've, we've done a, a, an admirable job at, at focusing uh, a, the needs, not just on families or low-income workers, but also not ignoring the needs of the homeless in our community. We feel that every housing authority needs to be engaged and be a part of the solution in, in helping uh, our friends who are homeless that don't have adequate shelter. And uh, most of our funding is federal funding, and as you all know, we're in a shutdown situation right now. Uh, fortunately, we were, we were given uh, housing assistance payments funds to give to landlords to keep people housed for January, and we also expect that for February. But no housing authority is expected, across the nation is expected to receive housing uh, payments for the Section 8 program, public housing, any of the federal housing programs in March if the shutdown continues. And it's, it's really a disastrous situation. Um, I, I ask all of you, just if you feel as I do, that, that people shouldn't be used as pawns and, and in this situation, call your congressperson and ask them to, to come to some sort of agreement to get the government back open. It, it, it will lead to people being put back out on the street if they don't solve the situation. And we don't want to see that. We already have a housing crisis nationally. Over a half a million people are homeless without a shelter on any given night. And in, in California, we, we have the a largest burden of homeless throughout the country. And we need to put our resources where they count. It's been mentioned by Kimberly and Chuck that we've, we've done a lot of great work uh, locally in, in having all of the, the different housing providers, service providers working together. Uh, we need to, to really solidify that and, and create that collective impact 
uh, model of everybody working together and, and directing the resources where they're most needed. And I'm excited about the, the regional uh, plan that, that's being worked on. So I'll leave it at that and be ready to answer questions later. Great, next we have Valerie Kissel. She's the executive direc director of the Youth and Family Services of the YMCA. Thank you, Emily, and good afternoon. I'm sure most of you in the room are familiar with the YMCA, but what many of you may not know is that we also operate an independent social service branch of the YMCA called Youth and Family Services. And we run four core programs, and our specific focus is with youth and young adults that are at risk. One of the programs that we operate is NOAA's Anchorage. And NOAA's Anchorage has been in the community under various um, management umbrellas for over 45 years. NOAA's is an eight bed residential home where we accept youth ages 10 through 17. They may be runaway, they may be foster, they may be throwaway youth. And we provide the basic needs there, um, a bed, clothing, a shower, and we also work on reunification. And we're very pleased that we have about a 98% reunification rate where we get these kids back into a, a stable living situation. Also at NOAA's, we operate street outreach. And two of my outreach workers are here today. And they operate, um, they work with youth, or young adults, 18 through 24, where we operate a drop-in center where the youth can come in and they get basic services. Uh, we can assist them with signing up for uh, getting their IDs. There's just a number of supportive services that we supply um, from clothing to hygiene. We also allow youth to store personal items at our facility because you don't want to be lugging around everything that you own with you on a daily basis. They also go out onto the street seven days a week in teams where they meet the youth where they are and try to get them to come in and accept services. So those are the programs that are run out of NOAA's. And we're also fortunate that we have a collaborative program with the Housing Authority that we call My Home. And that's specifically for transitional age youth who are either homeless or aging out of the foster system or have some physical challenges where the Housing Authority provides the units at artisan courts and we provide the case management because I think one of the things that you'll hear today that it's not enough to just put someone into a house. You have to have those supportive services around them to make them very successful. And that project has been in operation since 2011. And uh, we've also branched out with a pilot project that we're very excited about. We're working with a local uh, property owner and we have an additional six beds where we've brought uh, youth in and they're um, housed and they're able to find employment and also continue their education. And lastly, we operate a program, um, an after school enrichment program in Isla Vista and that's called the St. George um, Youth Program. So thank you all for being here. Thank you. So, yeah, thank you. So finally, we have Sarah Grasso, and she's the team supervisor of the homeless, um, homeless services team of the Santa Barbara County Behavior Wellness. Good afternoon. I'm really happy to be here and just wanted to extend my gratitude for holding this space and time to speak about an issue that I know we're all really invested in continuing to address. Um, so I'm the team supervisor for the Homeless Services Program with Santa Barbara County's Department of Behavioral Wellness. So the Department of Behavioral Wellness is a, is a mental health continuum of care providing specialty mental health care services to adults who have been diagnosed uh, with severe and persistent mental illnesses. So our Homeless Services Program, we function as a point of entry to county mental health services. What we do is we're out in the community on a daily basis doing street outreach, liaisoning with different homeless service providers, um, with our shelter partners, um, engaging those who want services and engaging those who might not be at the point where they're willing to engage or ask for services. 
but through ongoing intensive outreach and engagement, we hope to establish a relationship which we can build upon with the ultimate goal of getting them connected to the services that they need to not only improve their quality of life, but move them in the direction of um, achieving mental health stability and also um, attaining housing and then providing you know, eventual wraparound mental health support services to make sure that they're successful in housing. Um, so I'm really excited to share that we're currently expanding. So homeless services for the last several years since I've been in the program, which is four years now, we've been only in Santa Barbara. Um, we haven't had a homeless services program in Santa Maria or Lompoc. Um, and as of this month, we actually received fundi funding through DHCS, Department of Healthcare Services, um, to expand our programming into those regions. And so we're recruiting staff right now and hope to, in the next couple of months, um, be fully up and running um, to be able to implement those outreach programs in those regions of the county as well. Um, so thank you. And before you even did that, you really expanded your Santa Barbara team, which was great. Yeah, in the last two years, we've really grown. Um, and I think it started with the partnership that we entered into with AmeriCorps Home for Good. Um, we have right now 1.5, so one and a half full-time members who serve with our department. Um, and I, we've just been so successful in being able to cover more territory with their assistance. So very appreciative of that partnership. So we're going to turn the lights down, I think, a little bit lower now and jump into the Homelessness 101 presentation. And part of why we're doing this is we, we just know that we need to have a common understanding of even just basic terms around homelessness. If we're going to address homelessness, there's, you know, there's certain, as you heard from the panel, certain evidence-based practices that are very effective. Um, we want people to, to know about that. So we're going to get started here. So today we're going to talk a bit about, you know, what is homelessness, who's homeless in Santa Barbara County, what are key factors that lead to homelessness, you know, what's the current state in our county, what are we doing, and how can homelessness be solved, and how can you get involved. So when we're talking about homelessness, we're talking about a, a range of folks, so people who are at risk of homelessness, people who are at imminent risk of homelessness, um, the literally homeless people who are probably who you think about a lot of times. Homeless under other federal statute just means that sometimes the federal government helps us define who's homeless. And then also people who are fleeing or attempting to flee domestic violence, human trafficking, sexual assault, and chronically homeless people, we'll talk about that. So risk of homelessness, and I won't read every word on every slide. We will post this on our website so you can look it over more if you like. But risk of homelessness, as you might guess, are people who you know, are at risk of losing their housing and becoming homeless. They have low income and lack support networks to be able to access um, you know, housing if they lose their housing. And so prevention, which we'll talk about, is one way that we address this group of people. Imminent risk of homelessness. These are people who are really within the next 14 days very likely to become homeless. So how we address prevention might look a little bit differently for people who fit this, this category. People who are literally homeless, and again, you know, this can be youth, it can be families, it can be individuals, but this is who you might think of. These are people who lack a fixed, regular, adequate nighttime residence. And we've included language of exactly what does that mean. So that means people you know, who are living in places, public places, in parks, on beaches, streets, um, private places that aren't meant for human habitation. It's also people living in shelters and transitional housing programs that are designed to assist people who are experiencing homelessness. And then it also includes people who resided in different institutions for 90 days or less. Homeless, other, homeless under other federal statute, like I alluded to, this is when the federal government might say, you don't meet an exact homeless definition, like you might be doubled up, couch surfing, but you're a youth who lacks the access to, you know, to housing and support networks, and so you are considered homeless. Fleeing and attempting to flee domestic violence, it's in sexual assault and human trafficking. It's important to note that you know, when people are fleeing 
um, these situations that they can be put at risk of becoming homeless, especially if they don't have those other adequate resources and access to housing. Chronically homeless, and we've talked more and more about chronically homeless since I've gotten started working in this area. You know, chronically homeless, this refers to people who've been homeless for a longer period of time and have a disabling condition. And you've probably read articles about how people who are experience chronic homelessness can sometimes cost systems more because there are more calls for emergency services, there are more calls for police, um, you know, hospital stays can be longer. There are different reasons that we want to focus on chronic homelessness and some of the interventions and things we might do might be different when it comes to chronic homelessness. So who's homeless in Santa Barbara County? And this is from point in time information we've been gathering over years. And as Kimberly mentioned, we now use the Homeless Management Information System, HMIS, on a more daily basis. That's giving us really good data. But for many years, we really relied on the point in time counts. You all volunteering and being part of that really helps us. We'll talk more about the point in time count. But you can see that in our county, we've tended to count more people in the city of Santa Barbara than in other parts of the county. But over, over years, we've seen some trends that may indicate that you know, homelessness might be somewhat increasing in North County, maybe decreasing in South County. That could be you know, other, we've seen just a population shift from South County to North County, that might explain it. You know, we need more data to really come to strong conclusions, but when we talk to the people in Carpinteria, they really do say, you know, they're, they're, those are the 16 people we know. So we're getting to the point where, and Jeff, I'm sure we'll talk about this too, that we wanna know who's homeless by name and what their needs are. So also information that's gathered, demographic information, about how old people are, you know, the average age is in the 40s, but we've counted people and talked to people who are in their 80s. And I just heard, you know, from a very reliable source about a 94-year-old woman living in a vehicle. So we, we know that there are people of all ages experiencing homelessness. You know, gender demographics, we've seen in the last decade a trend of more women, even senior women experiencing homelessness. How are people experiencing homelessness? You know, are they living in vehicles and on the street, in shelters doubled up and transitional housing? So, you know, this, this is information we gather from the count and from working with the different partner agencies in our community. Across all the surveying we've done, you know, there are high self-reported rates of mental illness and even severe mental illness and high reported rates of substance use disorder also across the surveys. <clears throat> so what are key factors that lead to homelessness? And we didn't wanna just come up with one and say this is the one. We're sharing some information from different, different organizations. The first one, Center for Social Innovation, which we've worked with and they do social service, evidence-based best practice research. They've looked at American history. They have a great presentation, Homelessness in America, the big picture that looks at homelessness in America from colonial America to present day America. And they find that war, um, natural disaster, and when we've had significant economic decline that you see really increases in homelessness. The National Law Center on Homelessness and Poverty have indicated these top causes of homelessness, so lack of affordable housing, unemployment, poverty, mental health needs and lack of needed services, and substance use disorder needs and lack of needed services. Trauma is an emerging area of study around homelessness also, and you know, typically, it's related to people who are survivors of domestic violence, sexual assault, human trafficking, but in research that's happening, we're finding just trauma throughout the population of people experiencing homelessness. And sometimes that's trauma that happened before, and sometimes it's trauma that happens after people become homeless. And other kinds of trauma too, I mean, there are high rates of traumatic brain injury among people experiencing homelessness, so just that that area of trauma 
you know, veterans and post-traumatic post stress disorder is well known, but there's new research indicating that veterans of the more recent wars are um, experiencing even more post-traumatic stress disorder. The SPARC report just came out at the end of last year. This was a report on race and homelessness. So, you know, people, um, people of color are dramatically more likely to experience homelessness. So this is an area now at homeless conferences, there's more research and work in this area. Um, homeless youth, the research that we see around homeless youth, youth, we tend to see that, you know, there's research showing that there are high rates of physical, sexual, emotional abuse, involvement with the child welfare system, so not having enough support on leaving, you know, that system. Discrimination again, homophobia, so high rates of LGBTQ youth in the homeless youth population, overrepresented, and then poverty again. So that I might, you know, might give it to the panel now to just give any thoughts you have on why people are becoming homeless, what, or what you've seen. Well, I'll, I can speak to the youth population since we just ended on the youth population. We're seeing a dramatic increase in, like you said, subsections of the population. The LGBTQ population is like 120% higher risk of homelessness. And oftentimes, what will happen is that a family um, will be opposed to their identity, their gender identity, and they're what we would be called thrown away. They're kicked out of the house. Um, we also have found that lack of a high school diploma is a huge element in youth homelessness. So those are some of the things that we're seeing. One thing I would add is that it's important, I don't think homelessness is a very neat sociological category. And the more you interact and work with, with homeless people, you'll discover that every person's story is unique. And every person's reasons for, for no longer being in a home, it, it varies person to person. And so it's, it's easy to make assumptions about people's behavior or, or quote unquote lifestyle choices or all kinds of, prejudices that we, ha that we as a society tend to have about people in poverty, people of color, people who are gay or lesbian, people who are transgender. <clears throat> Those things of, in and of themselves don't cause homelessness. The bottom line is homelessness is a reflection of a lack of a place to live. And, and people need to, well, thank you. <laughs> um, and so it's a, while, it, you know, while social scientists and, and policymakers will want to look at these various groupings and various causes, we as citizens in our community need to recognize that these are people and they're members of our community who need help. Yeah, yeah I agree with Chuck. At the end of the day, it's, it comes down to a lack of uh, affordable and available homes for people to lay their head at night and to call their own. And um, I don't know, I, I also uh, subscribe to uh, Mother Teresa's philosophy that, um, you know, the greatest poverty is, is the lack of caring and the lack of love. If we had more of that, we, caring and caring for one another in the world, we could put forth our resources to where it really matters. So. Kimberly. No, I was just going to chime in that what I've seen, I was a direct service provider for a number of years and um, really excited about the work that's being done around the trauma look because I think that when we, we realize that there are many people with mental health disorders that do not become homeless, people with substance abuse disorders that do not become homeless, and I think we're going to see more and more, a couple of national conferences I've been to recently have really honed in on these, getting these good statistics of is this the, the largest thread that we have and that um, prolonged trauma in childhood or in adulthood um, can be one of the, the key factors. But as well stated, of course, the absence of a home is what, cause, is, is what causes homelessness. I'll add one more thing. So I think in the last couple of years, I've probably done hundreds of comprehensive clinical assessments. So when someone comes to the department and they're seeking mental health services, that's, that's what I do. I do an in-depth assessment to get at, okay, what is, what is the disability or the mental health condition that this person is struggling with? And throughout the course of conducting these assessments, 
I've really taken it, I think, beyond just the mental health condition in general and what we start to look at um, in relation to why someone is having difficulty accessing housing or staying in housing, it's, it's the impairment. So it's not about your diagnosis, it's not about the mental health condition, but what symptoms are you experiencing and how are these symptoms interfering with your ability to stay in a shelter, stay in housing, um, or even sometimes safely on the street. So I just, I guess the point that I'm trying to make is moving beyond the label of mental illness and just looking at the person as a whole person and what they're struggling with specifically. Great, thank you. So next we're gonna talk a little bit about what's the current state of homelessness in Santa Barbara County. And as you heard, there's something called coordinated entry, the coordinated entry system. It was launched January 23rd, 2018, so it's not quite a year old. And um, we work, United Way is the lead agency for coordinated entry. We work very closely with the County of Santa Barbara, which you heard is the lead agency for the homeless management information system and is the, um, what's called the collaborative applicant with the continuum of care. So Home for Good Santa Barbara County is designed to support a coordinated entry system, a no wrong door countywide system that engages and connects individuals and families experiencing homelessness to the optimal resources for their needs. And we do this because we believe every, that everyone deserves a safe place to call home for good. And as we'll discuss as we look at the data, we don't necessarily have all of those resources in place yet, but we're um, getting a much better picture of what's needed through this process. So, the coordinated entry system process involves pre-screening. So we're first seeing, is somebody literally homeless? You know, do they need prevention services? Um, we're looking at emergency services. So is the person a survivor of domestic violence, sexual assault, human trafficking? Should they be connected with a, a service provider who specializes in that? Do they want to be connected with the service provider who specializes in that? Because they can still choose to enter the homeless service system and the homeless service system then needs to be trauma informed and be able to serve them appropriately. Diversion, is there another safe place that they can go other than entering the homeless service system because people can get stuck and Jeff will talk about some of our efforts sometimes to reunify people and you already heard with youth that sometimes that's possible. So prevention I mentioned, referral. We always wanna be connecting people with resources in the community. So we talk about you know, mainstream resources, resources that aren't necessarily specific to people experiencing homelessness. This could be employment services or health services, um, you know, making sure that people we're helping meet people's immediate needs while we work on the housing. But then we get into the assessment process. And the assessment process in our county is the Vulnerability Index Service Prioritization Decision Assistance Tool. Thank you. The VI SPDAT. And there's one for individuals, one for families. We've got some interest in looking at one that's designed specifically for youth. And these tools are part of the requirement of a coordinated entry system. Essentially, a coordinated entry system has to cover the geographic area, it has to be accessible to individuals and families, and it has to have a, a way of prioritizing based on vulnerability. And um, we'll talk more about that. So coordinated entry happens at entry points. This is a little bit small here, but you can find the information on the website. So there's specific locations, days, and times across the county that people can go to, and PATH Santa Barbara is one of those. And people can um, enter into the coordinated entry system there, but it, it wouldn't be sufficient just to have these fixed entry points. We really needed outreach also. So we've been, as Sarah mentioned, kind of building outreach capacity before coordinated entry, and we continue to do that so that we can um, meet people where they are. And Jeff, you can come up. Thanks, Emily. Thanks, panel, for being here. And um, when I start working with um, friends without homes, and I think language is really important. Uh, for me, I try not to use the homeless term. I try to use people experiencing homelessness or something like that because it, it gets rid of the distinctive, we're all people, we're all working together on this issue. Um, but I started Pershing Park just with four of my friends, just cooking spaghetti in my house and bringing salad and bread to people on the streets, Gator and Shaky, and hanging out with people. So I really started on the relational level, 
Over time, I got the opportunity to learn under a bunch of other people. Um, the solution piece began to, people began coming to the park and talking about, well, you have all this trust with people on the streets. Why don't you begin to trust build uh, to other organizations like PATH, like Casas, Casas Brown, so at the time, or Be Well, or all these organizations. So I began to learn this solution piece. And we also got the opportunity to work under Becky Canis um, for the 100,000 Homes campaign. And she would say there's two crucial steps before you can succeed, the most, the most important steps are you need to know everyone by name and you need to know what they want and what they need. If we do not know everyone in our county who's experiencing homelessness, whether in a shelter or on the streets or in a camp or in a vehicle by name, either, uh, either uh, just an individual like myself not connected to any agency or an, an agency we can't begin to get them into the homeless management information system and get all the services around them to start working. So outreach is a key part of everything we do. So now the good news is, the great news is that countywide from Santa Maria all the way to Carpinteria, we are covering the map through various partners, AmeriCorps members, Home for Good, Be Well, Public Health, uh, some of the shelter providers send out outreach teams. There's volunteers, some of you volunteer, you talk to me, and you do outreach. We have covered the county. And so now, we're begin as we know everyone by name and we build this trust, we're beginning to get people connected to the right resources, to the exact thing that they need, which is good news, right? It's really good news. So you see a picture here of, um, and we try, for me, I try to incorporate people who are experiencing um, homelessness into uh, what the work we're doing, so we're not always um, imposing what we think upon them, but getting them to exp express to us what they think. So this is a great, I'm doing current work on State Street, and this is Madeline from Be Well, my friend Larry, who's currently experiencing homelessness, and myself, and we do outreach on State Street together. And it's, great, it's a great partnership because Larry will introduce us to his friends and trust build so that they trust what we're trying to do um, better. So a lot of good stuff is happening. Here's some of the things that we can share with you as far as data. So our coordinated entry data system for this year, we have 22 plus partners who are helping people move back home and create stable lives. So that's an amazing thing. We're trying to increase the amount of partners who are joined together, but now everyone's being able to share information, talk to each other and help people. We have over 1400 people who have been interviewed by teams and they're connecting people, right? We have 565 people and five recommended for permanent supportive housing and 597 recommended for rapid rehousing and, and a couple other slides. We'll be talking about the distinctions there. These are some of the things we wanna move the needle on. We've talked about it. You can't solve homelessness if you can't create housing and you can't move people home. So if you have all the people in your data system but you're not creating housing, you're not um, finding new landlords, you're not building, then there's nowhere necessarily to move them in. You gotta move that. Uh, we want to prevent people. Prevention's a big part. So I tell people all the time, in our county, one out of four individuals live at or below the poverty line. So we need to be make sure that we have enough prevention services to keep those individuals from and families from becoming homeless. And then we need to approve uh, supportive housing. So we see, I know there's some county supervisors here. There are some city council members here. Um, as we try to create new housing and bring those forward, we need to figure out how to work that through our system. And we need advocates who understand what we're trying to do to say, hey, yeah, we need this housing with these, with these proper supports. The proper supports are there. There's no reason not to house individuals. Living on the streets long term is deadly. Studies show that chronically homeless people are more vulnerable and two to three times more likely to succumb to preventable illnesses than the general population. And I, I would just have us just sit here for a minute, the, the life expectancy being 42 to 52 years. So I'm 54, right? One of the reasons why I work with Amity and other, other partners to create the vulnerability index was because a lot of my friends at Pershing Park were dying, where a lot of my friends who were the same age in housing were not. And I began to recognize that we have to do something about that. So a lot of this work is preventing that. It's making sure that people have good lives and you can't really become stable and have a great life. We don't wanna take people's rights away if they say homelessness is where they're at right now, but for the most part, getting them housing is gonna save their lives. 
So how can homelessness be solved? And now we're gonna talk about some of the housing models. So we're gonna talk about housing first as both an orientation and as a kind of a specific intervention. So of course, we wanna get people, as Kimberly said, that are experiencing homelessness into housing as quickly as we can. So that's just kind of across the board. But housing first as a specific intervention is an evidence-based intervention that requires an intensive case management model or a CTI team and those, to serve those who are most chronic and vulnerable, may suffer addiction, mental health. Um, and you have a team of people, you have a clinical team that's really gonna support them. And what I like about it, that model is it's also like what I talked about client-based. So when some of these folks are moving in and we think, well, the first thing they might wanna do is go through detox, that might not be the first thing. The first thing they might wanna do is learn how to use their microwave or go shopping. There's other things, so it's based on, once they're ready for the right intervention, that's kind of brought forward. So we need to push for more, well, we need to push for more, the, the federal government's pushing for more housing first, um, the idea to, to build these teams, and we as Home for Good are gonna be pushing for more housing first, and Emily, did you wanna say something? I did. I just wanted to say we have Kimberly Albers, I know you worked on a, a real housing first model um, previously, and one, if you can speak a little bit towards housing first. So I'm a believer, <laughs> uh, so I know there's you know some controversy. I think the biggest misconception, which I'm really glad the slide clears up, is that housing first isn't housing only. It's with wraparound services that takes the person at their own pace once they're in housing. So I have had the privilege of um, implementing a housing first model in several large um, settings now. and. We're consistently seeing at two years over 90% housing retention, um, even though these are some of the hardest folks to place. Now that's not locally, those are in other um, communities, but um, in the first year we implemented a true housing first model with clinical services, wraparound services in the home. We housed 123 individuals in San Bernardino County, um, the top of the list, the most vulnerable, so to speak, and um, we had 100% retention in year one. So it, it works, but it does take resources. Yeah, and I would just say on very small scale, maybe one unit here, one unit here, maybe just a handful, is, are we doing housing first in Santa Barbara County in any way that would replicate you know, what this evidence-based intervention is? So that's definitely something that you know, we all know we need to work on. Okay, so now as I discuss some of the other, you know, how can homelessness be solved? What are some of the interventions? Panel, please, you know, join me. But there's some very, you know, basic interventions. And this is what I started off by talking about, about how if we can understand the terms, kind of come from a, a point of similar understanding, that's gonna really help us move forward. You know, prevention, diversion, outreach, emergency shelter, transitional housing, rapid rehousing, permanent supportive housing. These are terms that even in the provider community, kind of making sure that everybody really understands is important. So prevention, we talked about this. Preventing individuals and families from becoming homeless can be very, can be effective. There was, you know, there's a little bit of a question about how do you prove is prevention effective? There have been some big studies in cities that have done, you know, controlled group studies of these are the people we've provided prevention services to and these are the ones we didn't and are they more or less likely to enter homeless service systems? And we're seeing that prevention can, if it's a, you know, a well-designed program, can be effective. There's very little right now in Santa Barbara County prevention dollars. There is, you know, there are programs like, you know, Legal Aid helps people who have eviction or the Rental Housing Mediation Task Force, but we historically haven't seen a lot of prevention dollars, but maybe the panel can talk about, talk about that a bit if there's anything new coming. Is there anything new with the, in the county at least with HEAP funding around prevention that people would want to know about? <laughs> Uh, I'll jump in, I guess. Uh, so we do actually um, prioritized for one of the new funding sources, the California Emergency Solutions and Housing Program um, that will be coming online in the spring with actual agreements with providers, but did prioritize homelessness prevention dollars for that source um, because we really do see that, um, as I'm sure it will come up, that one of the critical needs is actually finding units 
And so if you can keep someone from falling out of a unit they already have, you don't have to try and find you know, another apartment, which in this housing market is extremely difficult. So uh, prevention dollars are key, but they are minimal. And it's very difficult to target prevention dollars to who would actually become homeless without the assistance. So we do have to be really strategic when we're thinking of a community of how to invest in prevention, how to make sure those dollars are touching those that would actually become homeless rather than becoming sort of a straight, sort of low income rental assistance program. Yeah. So it, it is a challenging intervention, but a very necessary one. And maybe Rob Fredericks. Yeah. Well, I don't have any specifics. I just want to say I'm, I'm excited to hear uh, that, that uh, Governor Newsom uh, is proposing a Marshall Plan for housing, and um, I'll be excited to see the specifics on that, and I hope we get more cash-type cash funding and others through, through his, um, his efforts. So yeah. that, that would be exciting, because if we're going to be effective at addressing homelessness, we need three things, right? We need political will. We need supportive policies, and we need money. We need all three of those things. And so, some of the recent money has been great that's going to be coming into the county, but we need a whole lot more of it. And it's one time. Yeah. OK, so diversion. And you know, this is a strategy. Historically, we've sometimes called it reunification in Santa Barbara County. But it's a strategy around, do people have a safe you know, alternative place that they can go to and, you know, I'll bring Jeff to talk a little bit about a reunification he was involved with. Yeah, reunification, just to let you know, we make sure we check on the other end to make sure it's a good, stable situation we're sending people to, but it can usually be a family, a job opportunity, or another service provider that was successful with an individual or family before. But one of my favorite stories is that I do sock outreach sometimes with different youth groups or kids, and I took some junior high kids once out just on sock outreach on state and we ran into a couple individuals who um, they, they had an opportunity to join a circus which would provide funding and housing for them. And these kids called their parents and they raised the 200 and something bucks and helped get them home. That's one of my favorite stories because who wouldn't want to go? I wanted to join a circus when I was young. So <laughs> so the, the beauty of it is it's a, um, it's a, it's a way to keep people out of the, out of the system, our system, um, in a healthy way that gets them housed more quickly. So uh, there's ways to help with diversion if you want to talk more about that. Okay, and then outreach, and I have some panelists, I definitely want to touch on outreach, but outreach is what, you know, is going to people where they are, meeting them, helping meet some basic needs that they might have, but also really working to connect them with the coordinated entry system, help get them what we call document ready. So do they have an ID? You know, can we verify a disability doing these things that are gonna help them move towards housing? So I'll maybe start with Valerie just to talk a bit about the outreach that you do. I think it's, it's very interesting with the particular population that we serve. They're not easily recognizable, nor do they want to be. You have youth that do not want to be found by institutions, either law enforcement or child welfare, and they kind of blend in. I mean, I think you probably notice the clothing and the kind of laid back atmosphere of youth that are housed. They're very, very hard to find. And I know that our street outreach will work with some youth. We have some youth that we've been working with for years, four or five years, and it's developing that relationship and that trust. And then once you develop that trust, the individuals are more likely to accept other services from you. So it's really an ongoing process and it's not like one and done. But you know, when you're going out with the outreach, a lot of things um, to provide food and socks are huge. I mean, we wouldn't think it, but socks are huge. I mean, if you offer um, kids on the street a pair of socks, you'd think you were you know, giving them just this wonderful gift. So um, outreach is very important, and it kind of slide back a little bit into the reunification. One of the things that we do that's unique to our programming is that if a youth is on the streets because of a family situation where there might have been a crisis, they're arguing, there's a lot of um, hostility, the youth can come and stay at our facility 
and the family goes through counseling so that we prevent that child from either being thrown out onto the streets or being hit by a parent. So we mitigate that and it's a, like a cooling off period. And we provide the aftercare too because like I said, these things aren't easily resolved. It's something that you have to keep up with. So. And Sarah. Yeah. So I think something that we've um, observed and have found over the last couple of years is intensive outreach and intensive case management is working. So it's a matter of being consistent and following through and not making promises. Um, being where you say you're gonna be and picking the person up that you say that you're gonna pick up and just not you know, breaking promises that are made. Um, I think another thing that I've noticed that has been really beneficial to our outreach team and other agencies that we're working with is that there has to be a high degree of interagency collaboration. Um, so a lot of conversations that we've had recently have been about gaps in service or duplication. Where is a lot of outreach happening and where are the regions in the county that there isn't enough happening? Something that came from that is every Tuesday now we have a, a meeting where there's pretty much, I think, all the people in South County, all the different homeless service providers who are at the table doing outreach, some, uh, I think we also have restorative police, um, we have the State Street ambassadors who are coming to the table. Um, just, uh, we're having some really good discussions and understanding, you know, there, you know, why are people falling through the cracks and what do we need to do differently and where do we need to be and what times do we need to be there? And so I think having conversations that probably were happening in silos before and now are happening at a table that we're all at um, has been really instrumental and beneficial to our, our ability to move forward. Great, thank you. So emergency shelter and, you know, these are facilities where the primary purpose is to provide, you know, a more short-term shelter and I'm certainly gonna have Chuck Flax now speak to the role that, you know, this emergency shelter leading to housing can play. So in the city of Santa Barbara, we're one of several different organizations that provide emergency shelter. The one you may be most familiar with right now with the rain is actually the Freedom Warming Centers, um, who are open only during cold weather and, and rain situations. But then there's also the Rescue Mission and Salvation Army. To one extent or another, we'll take people in on an emergency basis. And then for families, there's Transition House, and many of you may be familiar with their programs as well. As I said before, PATH has 100 beds. 20 of them are dedicated to cottage hospital patients who have nowhere to go after receiving treatment. 24 of them are dedicated to behavioral wellness clients who similarly are, are seen, they're people that Sarah have, has talked to mostly. Um, they're, they're seeing providers in the community. Uh, they're not uh, uh, inpatient, they're outpatient uh, people, people getting treatment, but then they need a place to live. Um, and they stay with PATH and we work with them on, on helping to find housing and get them into a more permanent housing situation. The remainder of the beds, roughly 56 beds, are open and we're increasingly moving to a first come first serve basis. Um, I'm hoping to implement that actually in the next week or so where it's truly first come first serve and where we'll have a waiting list um, so that there's no subjectivity in terms of getting into PATH. Um, and case managers will work with people on, a, on an as-needed as basis. Thank you. So transitional housing, transitional shelter, this was in a lot of ways a more traditional approach that you know people would go into emergency shelter, then to transitional shelter, and then to housing. This can still work very well for you know groups of people, but for the people who have more of the chronic homelessness, the longer term homelessness, the disability, sometimes transitional housing isn't necessarily the best approach, but it's transitional housing is one of the tools in addressing homelessness. So rapid rehousing, and this is something I think a lot of people don't necessarily know, or this is a term they're not as familiar with, but this is something that, you know, those of us who kind of research and you'd like to know what's happening around addressing homelessness, it's continuously now coming to the conferences that we go to, that it can be a very effective intervention and um, help people rapidly get back into housing and to be stabilized. And I'm again gonna turn it over to Kimberly to you know, talk a little bit about rapid rehousing. 
So HUD likes to create words and then we're all <laughs> stuck with them um, in, this, in this work that we do. And so in this case, um, rapid rehousing really is just what Emily described. It's someone who maybe isn't that traditional, um, sort of what we think of when we think of someone's homeless, which I'm super glad the presentation's kind of dispelling those myths. But um, we know right now, according to the coordinated entry system, that about 40% of the people that have been assessed just need short or medium term assistance with housing location and stabilization services to re-enter housing. And so they don't need a subsidy for the rest of their lives. They may not need, they probably don't need those wraparound services for the rest of their lives. They just need a way to get back in to the housing market. And so rapid rehousing tries to do that very quickly by identifying who that, assessing that person to see who it is that that can qualify for that, that could sustain the housing on their own once they have the initial assistance, and then individualizing, gauging what, um, what services they need to be successful, and then they would become self-sufficient in, in 24 months is the maximum, but here we've been, it's much shorter, um, the, the number of months that they've actually received rental assistance for. And part of that is because sometimes they're being linked to a Section 8 or a Housing Choice mainstream voucher um, when they're pairing with rapid rehousing. So that's a permanent subsidy, but maybe not the permanent wraparound services. So rapid rehousing is an extremely part of the continue, extremely important part of the continuum of care, um, but it does, it is for a certain population that can sustain um, affordability long term on their own. Great, thank you. So and then finally, permanent supportive housing. So this is permanent housing with indefinite leasing or rental assistance paired with supportive services to assist homeless persons, usually with disabilities or families or adults with a child member with a disability in achieving housing stability. So this can be a model where you have a site. So El Carrillo here in the city of Santa Barbara, small studio apartments with supportive services. It, that's great. It can also be a scattered site model where you find units and you have a voucher and services that can be more mobile and go to where the person is. So there's some different models of how, what permanent supportive housing looks like, but key to permanent supportive housing are that you know people are signing a lease, they're, it's affordable, so they're paying usually 30% of their income for the rent and that those supportive services are, are there and coming to where they are. So, you know, how can homelessness be solved? And we really believe that no one organization can solve homelessness. Even the best organization out there isn't gonna be able to do that. It's gonna take, you know, it's gonna take the, um, the service providers, it's gonna take the policy makers, the elected officials, it's gonna take business people, it's gonna take faith communities, it's gonna take everybody in the general public to understand and learn more about homelessness and learn what long-term solutions are so that they can you know, really help build that public awareness and that political will so that we can achieve those long-term solutions to homelessness. I'm always looking to give people an opportunity to actually be involved in this kind of spinning crazy wheel. <laughs> and I just want to let you know, as we're at the, 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 the library in the center of Santa Barbara on state, that there is a two-year initiative we're working on right now to try to bring together the city, the county, all the service providers here at the table, um, businesses, faith communities, to work together to assist those experiencing homelessness just on state. So there are ways, there's a steering committee, there's different working groups, there's huge ways that you can get involved in actually being part of the solution, no matter what you really feel like your talent or gift is. Um, there's other ways in the county to get involved, but since we're right here, the library is a partner with us, I would encourage if you wanna get involved at that level, it's a great way to see all this actually happening, which is the joy of what's happening right now, is that this we are working together, this is really moving well. So I just wanna invite you to that if that's all right. Okay, so what are some of the things that we're doing to try to bring more resources to our community? Because like I said, we know we don't have enough resources. So one thing we've launched in this year is what's called the Home for Good Funders Collaborative. And it's based on a model that the United Way in Los Angeles launched where you bring together funders, so you know, philanthropy, 
county departments that contribute significant funds around homelessness. Um, you bring people together so that you can look at, you know, what are, what are the ideas? How can we coordinate efforts? And you look at, you create this emerging, the sight line of new funding because new funding has come into our county. We anticipate new funding will come into our county. We wanna have really good plans like we have heard the county is working on so that we can really address the, the needs that are unmet and um, work to start filling those, those needs. So one thing that, you, that we're looking at, it's also based on something the United Way in Los Angeles did. It's called a flexible housing subsidy pool. And there are a lot of words up there, but it was done with the Hilton Conrad Foundation. And it's, there's state and federal dollars. They're often very restricted. So if we are able to raise flexible local dollars, that means that if we, you know, if there's somebody that we want to move into housing, if they're, you know, we need to buy some furniture for that housing to make it a home, whatever it is to be able to be more flexible and move more people into housing, that's what we want this flexible housing subsidy pool to be able to do. So the conclusion around how, you know, I believe homelessness can be solved is that we need units of housing we need the subsidy that goes along with that, and we need the services to support those units. And that we know that government funding alone is necessary, but it's, so government funding that's dedicated to homelessness, we know is necessary, but we also know it's not sufficient to solve homelessness or really create these long-term solutions to homelessness. So I think that goes to where, what Rob said about, you know, the, the advocacy and really helping to move, you know, move that needle towards those long-term solutions. So we're gonna talk now more about how you can get involved. And the first thing we're gonna talk about is, vol is giving, I guess, there we go. So giving, and right now there are a lot of flyers out there for a sock and supply drive. And that's something that, a pretty easy way that people can get involved and help. We've got the point in time count coming, which we'll talk more about, but new socks, you know, um, hygiene kits, that type of thing can be donated at sites across the county. So we're working with the county on that. Um, and as you heard, socks are just, if you're wet, if you're cold, if you don't have the ability to do laundry as much as you would like to, new socks can really, are really appreciated. So advocate and do you wanna? Yeah, I think one of our goals um, is if the, you can sign up at homeforgoodsbc.org, but one of our goals is as we find out opportunities to advocate for some of the things we're talking about, whether it be funding, whether it be supportive housing, whatever we're trying to work on at, as a part of a solution, um, we want people to learn about that and be able to advocate about that in, in the proper way. So if you want to learn how to, how to advocate, a lot of times I will take people to uh, City Hall and just teach them how to do public comment. Um, and it goes a long way if people from the community come to the Board of Supervisors or to City Hall and say, hey, this is something we need and actually be educated and be a part of the team trying to promote something that actually we're, it's in the pipeline then we're gonna have more success. So the more that we unify and learn how to advocate together. So if you have an interest in that, you can either go to the website or you can talk to either one of us afterwards. And we're gonna uh, start this year trying to get information out to people and advocate together. So volunteering, and there are many different nonprofits that have volunteer needs. Um, you know, many of the shelters do and some of the outreach teams do. We also, through our Home for Good, we have an AmeriCorps program. At AmeriCorps, it's like the Domestic Peace Corps, where people sign up for a year and dedicate a year of service. They receive a living allowance and an education award. We have people of all different backgrounds and ages participating in the AmeriCorps program. So you can learn more about that. Feel free to come up and talk to me about that. But also through our Common Ground program, we have volunteers that go out every week and they go to different parks and different sites and they do outreach and they get to know people and you know help us you know help people navigate what can often be a pretty complex and challenging system. 
So the big volunteer need we have right now is the Santa Barbara County point in time count and how many people have participated in a point in time count before? Cool, so you're some of the, the people we've worked with probably before. It's usually for a point in time count about half the people who go out have done it before and half are new people. And if you go to the, um, if you go to the, there are flyers everywhere, but if you go to the liveunitedsbc.org website and you click on volunteer, you can sign up there, you can learn about where the trainings are, where the logistics centers are. Um, we've now have liveunitedsbc.org and we have flyers we can give you too. And we now have over 400 people who've registered, which is great to volunteer. And particularly in Santa Barbara, we're doing really good with volunteers, so thank you everyone. Um, but we want even more people to be part of this and to volunteer, so Dave. What, like how does it all work? So, are we, no, I don't know what you mean. Yeah. You get to come up in a minute, Dave. You can say, <laughs> trust me, you're, you're, you're on soon. So um, the point in time count is how we get a lot of that important data and information. It's required for federal and state funding more and more. So it takes lots and lots of volunteers. And as Jeff says, I'll say it for him, it's a great time where elected officials, you know, faith leaders, people, providers all get together and get together on a team with people who've experienced homelessness too and go out and are part of this big countywide effort. So these are Jeff and I, our emails, you can reach us, our websites, you can write those down. Um, we now have time for questions and answers. I have a couple people though that I'm gonna invite up first and Deborah, do you wanna come up first and I'll put this down a little. And you, can, you, you all will be able to ask questions of the panel, of us. But we've got one thing we, Jeff mentioned and we've talked about is, you know, there are people who have different ex lived experiences and we wanna have them also have an opportunity to speak. Come up here so you can, so they can hear you well. Come with that. My name is Deborah, and um, I'm a Native American. I, I kind of feel like Sacagawea right now because, um, you know, her mission was to help some people that were lost. And, you know, the, all the homeless people are lost people. I know this for a fact because I've been homeless for like 50 years. I left home at 15 and have been just some everywhere since then. And it's because we don't have a place to go you know, to lay your head or whatever. I was lucky enough, fortunate enough to get a place at El Carrillo for eight years I was there. And I don't know what happened. I mean, you know, when I first went in, I seen all these cameras and stuff and I thought something told me, uh, something's wrong with this picture. I mean, what do they expect us to do that they have all these cameras? Well, I ended up I let my son in, it was raining. I let him in the uh, apartment. I had to go somewhere real quick, doctor's appointment. He called me from the hospital. He had overdosed in my apartment. So of course that went against me. And um, just one thing after another, you know, um, I yelled at the lady downstairs, her dog was barking at night, um, all night long. And just one thing after another, they kept writing it down, writing it down, and then taking me for these eviction um, hearings. And then finally, I brought a caregiver in and I told him you got two weeks to prove yourself if you want this job. Well, he came drunk one night and he sexually abused me. And I turned him into the office to everybody, 911, he did go to jail, but I got evicted for it, you know, and I was the victim there. The guy was sick, he got me sick and, um, Ever since then, I haven't been able to be housed. You know, that looks bad, and they just don't let stuff like that go. And I've been in every shelter there is. Um, I recently left the rescue mission, and it was raining out that night. I had no place to go, really, and I went by PATH, and they said there's no winter shelter this year. 
And so um, they wouldn't allow me to, to get in. I ended up having to go. You know, I know all the homeless people in this town. They're my neighbors, they're my friends, they're my peers. Uh, to me, they're everything but homeless. I don't think that's a good word to use either because you never know uh, this, the mudslide could come down, the next day you'll be homeless. So how do you, you know, call somebody homeless? But the point being, I ended up getting socked up. I ended up um, realizing at the age of 65, and I'm handicapped too, I usually have my walker with me. Um, I ended up thinking, I'm gonna freeze to death out here. I ended up drinking some alcohol, which led me to believe that, you know, I just really felt like a degenerate. I felt like, well, I basically didn't have any place to, to go. And I ended up doing some drugs and hoped that I would meet, in the well, hopes that I would meet my demise because I told myself I would rather go and be with my creator than to lay in a bush and freeze to death. You know, I just, I, at my age, I can't do it. But I um, have filled out several um, applications. Um, oh, uh, but <laughs> the reason I was telling you about my uh, eight years at this El Carrillo was because they told me when they gave me the eviction notice, look, if you bow out gracefully, we won't, um, we won't, what did they tell me? Oh, we'll give you your, uh, half of your month's rent back, and we'll also give you your deposit back, and we won't um, stop you from using your Section 8. So I thought, well, that's a good deal there. So I'll go ahead, and within two days, I packed everything up. I had it spick and span, ready to rent, um, a walk-through rent, which they did. They gave me back my half a month's rent. They gave me back my deposit, but they banned me from using my Section 8 or housing for five years. And I said, what happened to your part of the deal where the only reason I did all that was because you said I could keep my housing. And they said, do you have it in writing? I said, I'm like, no, I trusted you guys. And they said, well, if you don't have it in writing, there's no way we can help you. So that's the reason now I can't get into any of these places that they have. And, um, you know, you can only stand these shelters for so long. Uh, the reason I left the um, mission was because you only get 10 days, and then after the 10 days, you can get a 10-day extension. But then after that, you're just out of there. You know, so it's like I'm to the point where I, I don't have any options. Do you have a question, too, that you want to ask? Do you have a question you want to ask? There was, but <laughs> I'm at a kind of a loss here. Um, there was a couple of real important questions I De had to ask. <clears throat> Deborah, I would, I'd be happy to meet with you and, and talk with you about your situation uh, with the housing authority yeah. one-on-one, -on -one, okay? Yeah, yeah, well, okay. that reminds me. It's because, um, you know, I got a victims of crime sure. suit. So that's, yeah, so I, Rob, will, Rob will meet and talk to you. Okay. And then Dave, do you, Dave is gonna come up next and then we'll, there are cards for you to write questions and pencils also in the back and we're gonna take those after Dave next. Okay, can I just real quick, yeah, I'll, I'll wind it up, I promise. Um, I got a victims of crime suit one when I was uh, sexually abused by the guy. And so, oh, um, Someone from housing, Tony Hood to be exact, said I could not use that because she had me on one of her little personal probationary period things. So there went my first month's rent, my last month's rent, all the utilities they were gonna pay for me for being a victim of a crime. Okay. But thank you. Yeah. Okay, now I'd like to introduce Dave Hopkins and Dave, come on up. He works with Doctors Without Walls, which is another great organization. Uh, okay, Debbie, I just want to thank you, first of all, just for being so vulnerable and open and, and sharing something so personal. And, and uh, I want to thank everybody up on the panel for coming in this morning or today. 
And uh, my name is Dave Hopkins, and I'm with Doctors Without Walls, and I'm the companion care manager. And I, um, I, recent, I, I was homeless in Santa Barbara from 96 to 2007. I was able to get off the streets and get a drug and alcohol counseling certificate, not to be a drug and alcohol counselor, but to come out and do outreach, because it was an outreach worker that saved me. And I, I just, you know, I, I've seen I lived over a decade of being homeless, and, and I've been working over a decade with the homeless, and I'm out in the street pretty much every day, and I really, I, this is just my personal opinion when I say solve homelessness, it's never going to get solved. And I do have some questions for the panel, and, and I do have the 1983 downtown plan on how to solve homelessness. So that was 35 years ago. And that plan hasn't done a darn thing. And then I see the same individuals in some of the same spots every day fighting with addiction or mental illness. Instead of being addressed with that, they're just ticketed and then until the tickets pile up and then they're brought into jail. And some, it's, getting, it's getting a lot better, but it still is not being addressed. Another gentleman with a nose broken open from a police officer for, from getting a ticket. And that's not working. But meeting the people where they're at, which Sarah and AmeriCorps and everybody else is doing, and getting out there and meeting them where they're at is fantastic, and that is helping. And getting them into housing, but unfortunately, some of the supportive housing people we're seeing out on the streets, it's like, why are you back out here? And they said, well, they didn't say, they, somebody else informs me, well, this person was having a mental health episode screaming at somebody that was outside their door for two months in a row, instead of helping him with that imaginary problem, he was evicted. Another gentleman who relapsed on alcohol twice, evicted, instead of getting the proper help in detox or whatever. And if the supportive housing's not there, then, then they're back on the streets. And that same gentleman, it was like, hey, we can get you back inside. And he said, no, thank you. I don't want to learn how to be homeless when you throw me out again. And I don't know how to answer those people. But the day center, and, and a lot of people, when I meet with some of the homeless individuals on private things, it's like, why do they always have to keep us out of the community? Why can't the homeless individuals be part of the community? When they had the big dinner or lunch on State Street, unfortunately, all the homeless were in the park saying, you guys eat over there. You know, at the Thanksgiving table, you don't sit there and push people away from the table. We all eat together. Santa Barbara is a community, and I think we should start inviting the homeless to be part of that community. And um, just a, a, my big question, and it's from a lot of the people out there, is is there ever going to be a day center? And unfortunately, when Casa Esperanza opened, all that money was funneled into that organization, and they mixed the chronically homeless, the mentally ill, the women and children, and the people that want to work all together. But you have the little boy that's crying because he's getting egged on by the mentally ill person who's getting egged on by the chronically homeless person, and the person that wants to go to work can't. But when there's separation like we have with the women's clinic, uh, the women's free health clinic, the Doctors Without Walls clinic, you don't see any women down on State Street on Fridays. They're, they're, they have a place to go and try and get their faculties together. I was driving those women to the facility and they said, isn't it nice we have a place to go today to have our dignity back? And that just, I mean, I'm up here cringing because I'm on the verge of tears because those people just want to be part of society and they are part of society. When we say, let's do the point in time count and figure out what's wrong with the, let's find out what the needs are for the homeless. Let's turn that around and find out what's wrong with the system because that's what's happening. So let the panel sort of speak to to these the concerns that have been brought up. Yeah, day center specifically. So first, yeah. let, let me. I'd like sure. to address uh, David. Thank you. I I agree with you wholeheartedly. We need to be more of an inclusive society with everybody, uh, and um, so we need to do better there. Um, with with evictions that you see, yet yeah, we have evictions at, for for some of our properties. It gets to a point 
where we need to protect the health and safety of the other residents. We like to be, we want, we're housers. We, we, it breaks our heart to evict people. It truly does. We do not like to get reached to that point. And it, it, it's after several different issues is when we get to that point. And, there, and we need to do better with wrapping around the services. If, if somebody is, is having an issue uh, and they're not getting the services, we need to do better as a, a, a community of service providers and housers of bringing those services together so that it doesn't get to that point, so we can have less evictions. I agree with that. I can jump in a little and just say that I know that um, siding a day center or an um, emergency shelter tends to be probably the, the biggest hindrance to, to moving forward. And as a group, we can all say it's desperately needed, but oftentimes what happens is as soon as we try to site it um, to this corner to this corner, then um, people in that area uh, fight very diligently, not, not saying just in Santa Barbara, but all over, um, but they don't want it right near them, right? They don't want it in their backyard. And so, um, so I, I hope um, there's is certainly, we talked about the governor's budget seems to be very much prioritizing um, that type of activity, that there'd be resources available, but we will still have to as a community decide where, and we need your support to vocally. The people who are no will always be at the council meeting. We need, our, or the supervisors meeting, we need the people that are also saying yes. We've got, we've got question cards, and we're going to do those first, we said. So if you have a written question, we're taking those first. Um, anyone else want to speak to what's been brought up so oh, far? I was just thinking in the interim, there is um, the new Father Virgil Cordano Day Center that opened. I hope I said that yeah. right. But it opened. It's up on um, Kyrie Al before you get to the SunCal offices so that I don't is it Kyrie Al? So it's St. Vincent's is sort of experimenting with day centers that are smaller and maybe more scattered, so not one large center. So I think if that one is successful, that might be something to look at also moving forward. I think we identified that transportation is an issue too, so we're, yeah. we're having that discussion. Um, I just want to add when I think Dave was speaking to kind of bringing the community together, I just... I want to invite people experiencing homelessness to the table every Friday morning from 9 to about 10, 15 a.m. We're inviting people to our offices, which are um, on De La Vina Street, De La Vina and Mission. Um, we're bringing to people to the table and just trying to have a conversation and ask them what they need, um, what are we not doing enough of, what can we do more of, and it's, it's been a really beneficial way to, to get and receive feedback, so please join us. Um, 2034 De La Vina every Friday morning at nine. So one person wanted to know the total count of affordable units and Kimberly, I'm gonna to turn to you and I'll probably say that we don't have 100% accuracy in that, but do you have any, share either what we're doing or where we're going to, to know that? You know, I didn't bring the total, P um, I would call it, I don't know the affordable units. Yeah. Um, that's a, a much larger population, um, but I'm gonna take a, a stab and Rob help me out if I if you can um, that it's about 250 permanent supportive housing units being supported uh, inside the continuum of care um, right now so those are those long-term subsidy um, permanent units and then we have about enough um, assistance for to serve about probably 75 households through rapid rehousing a year right now it with aside from this one-time funding that's coming online but our existing um, funding sources fund about the, those two numbers. So not exactly the answer to the question. Um, there's much more affordable housing um, than there is uh, permanent supportive housing dedicated just for homeless persons. And one thing we're working with is to get some of those affordable housing providers that have beds that are homeless dedicated to make sure that they're all going and being counted in the same system. So that's, you know, a lot of them are in the system, but not all of them. But all that data is data that we need in order to understand what the need is and what we need to do, you know, to have, have be able to meet that need better. And then there was also, in similar light, you know, a question about how many beds, just emergency shelter type beds that are available. And as Chuck mentioned, that goes up and down depending on if it's certain months of the year, the warming centers activate under certain conditions. Um, 
any anyone have a sense of actual unit shelter beds though well, I would just say that I think what's encouraging to me is that when the Freedom Warming Centers open, people go, right? Yeah. <laughs> and so that shows that if there was a, um, a shelter of similar um, openness or low barrier, that um, they would likely use it. So I think, um, again, these are, are rough numbers, but I think in the first, um, since November 15th, when they activated, that they've served about 459 unique individuals across the county. No, um, that's a t that would be a total, unduplicated. Um, I don't have that. I mean, the warming centers, for example, mm -hmm. they um, don't turn people away because of capacity. They have contingencies in place for overflow if they need to do that. So when when we get to the warming center activation criteria. So that, you know, the, the people do have to leave warming centers early in the morning because a lot of the faith communities that host them have preschools and other activities. So this question of is a day center necessary or more emergency shelters necessary, I think are all good questions. One person asked if a day center could be placed at the existing police station when the police station moves to the new facility. I don't know if anyone has thoughts on that or <laughs> if we have even ideas yet on what they will use the, the existing one for. I do think that site if it would be a perfect permanent supportive housing development and maybe a component of a day center there, but I, we would have to talk with people, so. Yeah. And I, th I think it's important, the way the conversation's going is, is of some concern to me. I think it's important to recognize that there's been a sea change in how we address homelessness. And, and you know, with all courtesy to the members of the audience who are in fact homeless, um, all the evidence shows that the answer to homelessness is to provide permanent housing. So everything that we can do to create housing opportunities for homeless people and for all people, that's the solution. So the need for shelter beds, maybe that would, you know, that would be good. The need for a day center, though, you know, th these are short-term things that would take care of maybe an immediate problem for a handful of people right now. Bottom line is though, Santa Barbara is in a housing crisis. Rob said it earlier. The entire state is in a housing crisis. Gavin Newsom is talking about it right now. And we as a community can't continue, and it, this is really preaching to, I hope, the choir, um, in the sense that we as a community for the last 50 years have resisted any kind of development, any kind of development. So when PATH was created, there was people around the block protesting it. When you know, when we tried, when Rob tried to put put up uh, 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 tiny, tiny homes, homes, thank you. There were there was there were hundreds of people protesting. So in other words, what's needed is a community that embraces the problem and looks long term for solutions. Kimberly saying we're putting together a plan. A plan means something that will be implemented that people will say yes, yes in my backyard, yes to creating new housing opportunities, not just for homeless people, but for working people, and even for maybe some rich people. But we need to create that housing to enable people to live here and, and do our part as a community. Otherwise, we're gonna see an increase. And it, you're seeing it in LA, you're seeing it in San Diego, in the Bay Area, it's out of control. So one and thing the I only reason we aren't seeing it in Santa Barbara right now is it, because it's it's a matter, unfortunately, it's a matter of time. So my, my belief is we're all together here. There's a big full room. People care about the problem. Let's talk about the solutions that are permanent and that are affordable and that end this problem once and for all. And I disagree with Dave. I think we can end homelessness if we provide the, the resources. One thing I want to say also is that the question asking about can we use that piece of land is a really good question though because affordable housing can be really expensive to build and develop and if cities and counties can identify property, uh, even private folks sometimes have either sold below cost or donated property, that can be the determining factor of whether an affordable housing 
development can be built. Absolutely. So, yeah. yeah. So it's a good, really good question. Um, somebody wanted to know, is pregnancy still uh, the number one preference to get into housing? And it, I mean, I think I can answer, it's not one of the preferences. Yeah, it's not a preference. There, we can do some preferences. So housing authorities and their administrative plans can give some preferences to, you know, veterans, to people experiencing homelessness, to people who, you know, have disabilities. So there's some preferences that can be considered, but that's not one. That's correct, that's yeah. not a preference. Okay. So I'm gonna take some questions from the audience now. So we will have mics. Uh, my name is Travis Kiefover, and I'm a, currently on each and every one of your lists. And um, I worked here in Santa Barbara. I grew up here in Santa Barbara. I worked for 10 plus years at Milpas Rentals, doing a great job down there, paying my taxes, doing everything I was supposed to. But I moved out of town due to the fact that I couldn't afford things around here. Um, I was diagnosed with cancer in June of last year. Um, I'm now a patient at Ridley Tree. Um, tomorrow morning at five o'clock, I'm going in for surgery. They're gonna remove half of my liver to get rid of the cancer. On every each and every one of your lists, I've been waiting, and of course you need to wait, and I do thank you for the work that you guys do. Um, my only question is, is that I can't get a hold of anybody anymore. Um, I'm, I, people self-housing, nobody, nobody's ever there. I've seen the mailbox overflowing. Um, there's no way of finding out, even with HUD or anything like that, that I can find out where I am on the list or what's going on because I'm going in for half my liver to be removed tomorrow at five o'clock in the morning. I'm currently calling PATH every single day, trying to get a room. Um, I've even talked to College Hospital about extending my stay because I have nowhere to go. I'm now six foot two, sleeping in a 9200 uh, prelude. And I'm sorry I'm getting emotional, but I just have nowhere to go after this surgery, which is gonna be from here to my belly button. And I don't know where to call anymore because I can't get a call back. And the main thing is, is that I'm not a drug addict. I may have had my past, but I'm not a drug addict. I don't have mental issues. And once I mention that, it's like I get put on the back burner. And I'm in a very bad state right now. To, um, and everyone's telling me, go to a shelter. Well, there's a big risk of infection when I go to a shelter. And I'm about to have half of my liver removed tomorrow morning at 5 o'clock. And I don't know where I'm going to go after that. So my question to you is, where the hell is everybody? because I can't get a hold of anybody anywhere, anywhere anymore. That's my question to you. So if, if for the housing authority, if, if there's a problem, I wanna hear about it. If people are supposed to. I've been calling constantly. I've been calling after, constantly. After, after, come get my, get my card and I'll, you, I'll be your contact. Thank you very much. You're I welcome. do appreciate that because I've been trying to get into, I've been trying to get the path. Path doesn't have oh, a room. Do you wanna talk? Room. Bring, them, bring the mic yeah. over there, please, someone. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> My name is Saur Vleda. I'm the Director of Population Health. I'd be happy to help you with your current situation and make sure that you get some services after your surgery. Yeah. Okay. okay. And we have a question there now. Hi, I'm Lakrisha, and I've worked with uh, going across the country, taking vacant and abandoned properties, bringing them to code for Section 8 HUD and affordable housing sectors. And my question for Santa Barbara specifically is how often do you work with the conjunction of public and private sectors to develop, say, mixed use in downtown with integration zoning? And also, is there movement towards decreasing policy for mandating, say, parking when you're retrofitting properties for affordable housing sector? So we do a great deal of development uh, for affordable housing in, in Santa Barbara where we can. It's it's difficult because it's a, uh, a built out community. So we, we do have to partner with, with local property owners oftentimes and to, to get something built. So we do a, a great deal of collaborative uh, developments. We utilize the tax credit development uh, program and other programs to build the housing uh, and try to work in with the zoning that's there and, uh, and to make it work for the community. I'm not sure I'm answering your question exactly. Um, well, my question was more along the lines in terms of percentages when it comes to your housing that we have vacant properties that could be like for a reimagined downtown moved mm -hmm. into mixed use projects. Right. How often do you have the public sector coming and helping and funding and investing into that? Mm -hmm. Right. So we we are 
currently meeting with a few property owners along State Street to see what we can get built uh, in for bringing people to live in the downtown core in, in the Central Business District. Uh, hopefully that can work. It's uh, a lot of our funding sources though uh, are for low income uh, and it's it's a tough nut to crack with with the cost of, of development and, and making it work with the private owners that of uh, the developments they have. We're currently, uh, tomorrow night, we're having a, a community meeting with La Casa de la Raza. We're partnering with them to, to, read, to see if we can redevelop their property to provide affordable housing. And we have to get creative if we're going to have a demonstrable positive impact in the community Great. So for providing housing. Thank you. So we are going to wrap, start wrapping up now. I want to give all the panelists 30 seconds. One thing that the League of Women Voters is doing right now is we're in the process of updating our homeless policy. It's a very good homeless policy. It was written in the 80s. It actually, you know, kind of foreshadowed the need to plan and work together and, you know, focus on affordable housing. But we do feel like we can even strengthen it. So I just want to kind of Give it back to the panel for any closing words on what you think is important um, for people to leave with today. You can go back to the housing as the ultimate thing. Let's go further before that. We are people who have dreams, we have, we have losses. The spectrum is enormous of who we are, but the stories, as you said beautifully, are very unique, and every one of us is so special. We are dying out here, and I know that's dramatic, but because I only have a moment to speak, what I could tell you is you need to, the public needs to be involved in this. They don't, and that's where you will get your financing, we need to dialogue with them and law enforcement and Cottage Hospital. Some of the horrors that I'm listening to, I know the names of the home, many of the homeless. I've been doing this since the 90s myself on some level. I now am homeless and this journey is quite astounding. It's an eye opener. These are the beautiful poets, musicians, artists. Some of them have amazing, uh, it, it, it's just, I want, the public to understand we are not animals, but when you, beautiful Santa Barbara insults us, the fact that we will die on their beautiful streets, that has to stop. I'm concerned about the vets who are going to drink themselves to death. Where is that outreach for them? And that other problem I'm seeing, and I'll, I could say more, is that promise that, that I will get help or we, they will be back. Don't do that to us because we, our little flame of hope will just fizzle because this is the other problem. It never seems to happen. And the drug issues, I could speak to that at length. Believe me, none of these people ever wanted those drugs in their bodies. It's primal living. It's primal living. Food, shelter, all these things. It's a huge. Thank you. Thank you so much. Okay. So we'll start again with Kimberly. Um, just, you know, thank you all for um, your input. It's great to have such a diverse group um, sharing. And I think that, you know, what I'm taking away from today is, you know, we need immediate shelter, right? And we need housing. And we need this community to embrace those things in order to solve this issue so that we can meet those individual needs. I think that the passion in the room and the turnout and the, um, the political wins are all going in the right direction. And, and I think that's important. I want to end on a positive note because I do think, as I said at the outset, we're at a, at a really good time for opportunity. You know, the, the woman got up before and asked about uh, vacant properties. We have a lot of vacant property in Santa Barbara. What are we doing about it as a community? And, and you know, and we have newly elected officials who are asking some of those same questions. We have a governor who's eager to spend some of the surplus on developing new solutions to the problem. So stay informed, you know, stay close to us. One of the great things about Santa Barbara is you can get up and complain you don't have service and, and service providers will rush to your aid. So this is 
a good time and a good place, and I just want to thank you. So I uh, agree with everything that's been said, and I'm humbled by hearing a lot of the um, testimonials here today and the work that we need to do better as a community uh, to provide for people in need. And uh, unfortunately, no one agency or organization owns the homeless issue of creating housing, and yet no, no one agency own you know, there's no one to really have it under their umbrella. That's why we're working together to, to create solutions. I wish that, that we could provide for housing for every 5,500 household that's on our wait list right now that desperately needs housing, but we can't. We don't have the funding and we don't have the units to provide, and that's what we need. You know, I echo the thoughts of everyone so far, but I think one of the most important things is to have the open dialogue and to get the information out there and to also bring other people into this conversation because like Rob just so very well put, there isn't one entity, not one agency that's gonna solve this issue. It's gonna take all of us working together. So I thank you all for coming and sharing your stories and your perspective. Thank you again for having us. Um, I agree with everything that's been said. I think something that I'm reminded of on a daily basis is the need to be flexible um, and to not and impose my agenda or the agenda of the agency that I represent. So um, I hold that near and dear to my heart and I just am gonna keep on trying to be flexible to get people linked to the services that they need. Great, thank you. And again, Thank you to all of our panelists and for everyone who came here today. Jeff and I, especially in 2019, we wanna reach out to more groups, organizations, to talk about homelessness, to talk about kind of this, the common language, the terms, the basics, so that people can have a better understanding. So our emails are up there, and if you're part of an organization or a group that we can come to, we would love to do that. So please invite us. Thank you.